So guys, I'm just going to call on each one of you with each of these questions. Um, the number one thing I want to know is how many closings have you had or do you have in the pipeline to happen since we sheltered in place March 16th? So Kenny, you go first. Uh, we've only closed three, no, four while, uh, while shelter in place has happened in the last uh, you know, 50 days. Uh, one of them was a seven day cash flow. So nothing like super unique about the shelter in place affecting it. And then we have one in Newark that's pending. Uh, but right now we do have 11 listings on the market all in Oakland. Uh, and the, the most recent ones I put in the last week has been getting pretty good traction and showings. But the earlier ones are pretty, pretty quiet. Got it. Wonderful. Daniel, what do you have? What have you closed or have in the pipeline to close? And I like that Kenny added. And what, how many listings do you have? So um, let me take it from a little bit of a different angle because it's not just what I produce. I am a working broker, so I do do my own you know, book of business, so to speak, but I'm not, that's not the primary thing that I do. I've got all these people that work here that are trying to do deals. Um, in March, we closed 19, and in April, we've closed 13. So we're running at about a 60, 65% run rate of what we did, say, pre-COVID, pre-shelter in place. Um, certainly, it's much more challenging to show property today. You know, it's hard enough when you got your glasses, your phone, and your lockbox key. Now you got gloves, a mask, glasses falling off, lockbox key. And it's, you know, it's hard for people to, to go through the exercise on showing. But buyers are pushing people out. I think we still see a fairly robust market. I heard today from one of my agents on that wrote on Fry, there were five packages out and eight offers in. That's really strong. Um, on the house on Wallace that Wally Tiara has, 46 disclosure packages out. Those are huge numbers. So buyers are out, things are still happening. Um, you, you just gotta sort of adapt your systems and what you're doing to function within the rules and the laws today. That's, that's, that's what I'm seeing. That's true. Carrie, how many uh, have you closed, have your pipeline to close, and how many listings do you have? Got it. So um, just to quantify, it's myself and three other agents who are active and in production. We have a support team of licensed agents as well, but out of the four of us that are in production, since SIP has gone into place, we've had 10 closings. We have another four escrows that are pending and hopefully will be closing soon. And then uh, we have another four active listings on the market at the moment. Wow, terrific. Deidre, same with you. No closings, but five pendings. And um, I have one active and I have three that are hoping to go on in May. Um, so that's my pipeline and I'm, I'm, um, pos I feel real good about the, the transactions that are pending that they will close. So that's good. Love it. That's great. So clearly these guys know how to do business in the virtual age. So here's my uh, question. <coughs> How are you getting leads? Do you lead gen? Not everybody leads gen. Some people are just gaining momentum on their past clients and referral business, but most people do. How do you lead gen? And um, if so, what are you doing and how are you capturing those leads? And I'll again, go with Kenny and on down. Um, nothing different than what we were doing a month ago. Um, we decided to, we were already kind of cutting costs for the year. So we've kept our, our current existing marketing. We didn't cut any of those. Um, so I said, I, I'm at ESP Realty now and I signed a pretty big lease, uh, six months and we're paying for that. Uh, outside that, we're, we're continuing to do marketing on email. We've up our email game by reposting like KCM blogs and tweaking into that. Uh, just list the emails. Of course, um, we're still doing postcards. And then for our listings are, itself, we're doing, we're making sure we're doing virtual staging, three, four plans, and the three tours and everything. And then on on the like recruiting team leader side, we've been we recruited about ten agents this month by actively engaging in social media and constantly po uh, being in front of people. And you know these webinars, I I think I've been on like over twenty five webinars in the last uh, forty something days, which is that able to help me stay in front of clients and stay in front of um, 
other agents. Great. Daniel, what are you for Legion and So the, the same things that Kenny's talking about, you know, we have a small buy on Zillow, not a big buy. So some of that has brought business in. It's emails, it's postcards. We seem to do really well with postcards. All the agents that are sending them out seem to get some level of response on those. And so the old style marketing still, still applies, sending out postcards, email blasts. Um, we've done a few Zoom meetings, not a bunch. Um, we did our first virtual open house. Or I should say I did my first virtual open house last Sunday. That was fascinating to do. It's sort of exciting to learn new things and to try it. Um, and, you know, that's how we've done it. We're still, we have a sphere. We, you know, as you mentioned earlier, I've been doing it for 30 years. So my own personal book just sort of rotates. Um, and the agents themselves, it's still the same way it was. Not much has changed that way. Carrie, what are you doing to lead Jen, capture your leads? How are you? Well, of course, echoing what everyone else said, there's past clients, referrals. We get a lot of business through Yelp. I know Deirdre has a similar story on that. Uh, our website and SEO brings us a lot of leads through Brivity. Uh, we have lender referrals. We have a lender referral program that we use. Um, and then... So that's all pre-SIP. Post-SIP, we have been holding, well, we've, ho we've hosted five home buying seminars, and, or web webinars, and five home selling webinars. And next week, we are going to be unleashing our investors webinar. Um, all of those, we advertise heavily through Facebook and drive the traffic to Eventbrite where they have to sign in. So we've been getting a ton of leads through that. We also have been doing a ton of open virtual open houses. We have had how many open houses now? Nine virtual open houses so far through Facebook Live of which we promote those with online, um, we uh, do the Facebook ads on those and when they click on it, they have to register to get the information for the virtual. Uh, one thing I do wanna say is if people are holding virtual open houses, here's a tip, get your pen out. Um, we were at first excited that we were able to put the links for those in, uh, in the MLS confident, I mean, public remarks. And then we were hoping that that would translate to Zillow leads and um, Redfin leads because it would go in their public remarks. But they are filtering those websites out. So my tip for you is to spell out the URLs to those. So if I was saying my website, which is um, the Monday team or Monday team agents, dot com i would spell monday team agents space dot space com and that's how you get through that zillow filter or the redfin filter so then it's showing actively in their public remarks um lead generation has been really good and the way that we've been doing our virtual open houses in order to gain leads in addition to the the sign up um, click throughs from our ads is calls to action. So we're not just showcasing our homes. I mean, of course we are. And, you know, honestly, I feel like our open houses are doing the sellers a bigger service being done virtually because we're not distracted by all the activity in the house and the random questions from the buyers. Instead, we're literally selling that house. We're showing off the features. We're showing off the functionality. We are telling stories that the sellers told us about the first time that they, you know, stepped into the garden, the, their feelings and, and translating that directly to hopefully what will be um, a potential buyer. But during those open houses, we also place things throughout the house which have calls to action on them. So Easter Sunday, we had an open house. So we hid Easter eggs throughout the home. And whenever our, our ladies on my team would find 
those eggs, they, you know, would open them up and say, oh, you know, the, um, this kitchen is big enough to add a, an island. Would you add an island or would you, you know, keep the space open um, and, you know, able to, to move about and have several people in there? Comment below. And then other calls to action would be, are you just getting started on your search? If you need a good lender referral, text me at, and they would put their phone number, they would verbally tell their phone number. Um, and then while, so we have the four ladies on our team that are at, um, in production. And so we staggered our open houses to be kind of a, uh, a relay race. <laughs> so one would go and then as one was signing off, the other was signing on and then we would all sign on to each other's open houses in order to get the Facebook activity juice. We would be commenting and liking and loving and cheering each other on because, I mean, honestly, none of us really know how to do virtual open house. We've been forced into this situation, right? Um, so we have a choice to either sit back and watch and see how everyone else does it or just make it up. What's the worst thing that could happen? Your sellers are gonna be happy that you're actually doing something extra. Um, and my one of my mentors that I look up to, Ben Kenny, good friend of mine, he says we justify our inaction, we complicate things in order to justify our inactions. And so it's not difficult. It's easy. Do what you're normally doing, but think about it beforehand. Add the details to make sure that people know who you are, know where to find you, and, um, and then add, you know, of course, some uh, ads and, and lead capture surrounding that. But we've been getting... I'm excited. <laughs> I don't know if you can tell. Um, I'm excited because we've been actually getting a lot more leads through these avenues than we have even in our, in our regular open houses. So I feel good about that. Great. Love it. Deidre, how are you getting leads and how, what are you doing to do it? In I'm a little, I, I, I feel a little old fashioned compared to some of my uh, colleagues up there, but um, I was very fortunate that when I started 2020, I had about 10 listings on the books that I was working with. So when all of this happened, it was a matter of kind of keeping things going, keeping the communication going. We got maybe a hint that SIP was coming the day I put one of my listings on the market, um, which was a Friday before SIP, which was, um, SIP was the 17th. And so um, I did a walkthrough video of that property just in case, and I uploaded it to IGTV. And that got about 400 views. And then I kept it in my Dropbox um, file so that if anybody inquired about it, because um, this was before I started doing the Matterports and all of that, it was just a very basic, it was about three and a half minutes walking through the house, pointing features out. So I was able to email to potential, you know, agents and clients the, the house. Um, and so we, advertise that as we understand somebody only feels like they get a tape of the house through a video. So we're like right enough for a subject to seeing it. You know, um, I think the biggest thing right now that I, I just want to put out there is um, online is good and has been good to me in terms of Yelp, but I'm still doing things like checking on people, texting people, how are you doing, how are you feeling. Some people are deciding to wait and kind of watching the sidelines to see how um, the market fears out. Some buyers maybe if they wait a little bit longer, there could be a softening or more of an advantage. And the key is, I think, stay in touch with people that are already in your pipeline. And, and uh, recently passed client. The majority of my business that's uh, carrying 
I don't. Can you guys hear me? I hear some. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Gustavo. Well, yeah. Thank you. So we're muting everyone, and please stay muted until we have our question period, because otherwise it interferes. Sorry. Sorry. So the majority of my uh, business came from word of mouth and um, Yelp, just like Carrie said. And um, I find that um, the word of mouth, you get people who are probably more in line with your personality because they were referred by a past client who liked you and worked with you. So nurturing those relationships are, are, are really helpful. Um, but it's just a matter of just staying on top of the stuff that you have, making people feel um, in this time that there's no pressure, communicating with them the changes, because we've already had how many iterations of a PEAD, you know, how many times have we had that we're not essential, now we are essential, now you can show next week at owner occupied house. I think people like that information. I've gone on Instagram a couple of times and just updated people on the market so that people know that they can come to me without pressure and I can be a resource. So um, that is kind of how I'm doing business right now. And I actually um, like that. Um, one thing that I want to say is that I'm asking all of my clients to raise their prices to a price that they're willing to accept. Because if our goal is really to minimize the risk and exposure to people, um, I kind of like it in a way because um, transparency and clarity, I think is really appreciated in this time. And um, you know that when people are viewing the house, they're not looky-loos. They are people who are genuinely interested in the house. And you know that if you raise the price to a more transparent price, then all the cards are on the table. And I think buyers are appreciating that as well. Yeah, that's really smart right now. Okay, so what are, I, I can only imagine the kind of conversations you're having with buyers and sellers. So, you know, some people use scripts, some people memorize scripts and then they became natural to them. What kind of scripts or conversations are you having with sellers or buyers, especially ones that are not sure about buying or selling during SIP? And I'm going to go backwards and I'll start with you, Deidre. Okay. So I have a client and um, she's very proactive. Um, it's a property that I put on TAN last December and um, now she wants to go on the open market. Um, and there are two things that closed. One sold for less than we thought it was going to sell. So I just had the honest conversation that, you know, it's too soon to tell how, how you know, prices are affected. But I feel that we need to come out at a price you're willing to take. And I just wanted to just ask her straight up, you know, you have three kids at home. Are you comfortable with someone coming in your house, even if you leave the house, even if they wear gloves, even if they, they, they wear masks, you have to be okay with that. You're going to, as a seller, have to sign the PEAD that you take on that risk and that you're okay with it. And I just wanna have this conversation with you. And if now is not the time for you to do it and it's not best for you, then that's okay. And I think right now, giving people an out they don't always take it, but they appreciate it. And it builds um, the rapport and the trust. And it, it, it's, it's something that I think will pay you back tenfold by giving somebody an out. Um, but just sharing with them just the process that their house might be on the market a little bit longer than before. Um, the protocol that we do um, right now, um, you know, my trying to just figure out which photographers and home inspectors will go into these owner-occupied properties, things of that nature. I think just communicating with people without a script. How are you feeling? What's going on? You know, what is your timing? What is your budget? Has your budget changed? Those type of things. And, you know, tell me your biggest concerns about selling or tell me your biggest concerns about buying is something that, that I think just works in any market. 
Terry, what are you, what kind of scripts, conversations are you talking, you know, speaking with your buyers and sellers who have some trepidation around SIP? So for my vacant property sellers, the, the script that comes out is, you know, what if you had nothing to lose by going on the open market? We've never had a more captive audience if they're not watching Tiger King on Netflix they're scrolling and looking at homes <laughs> on the internet. Even people who love their homes are looking at homes. I look at homes. My husband looks at homes. We're happy where we're at, but it's just what we do. And we always dream about, you know, oh, maybe someday we'll move to the hills or maybe someday we'll move to Hawaii or whatever. But there's never been a more captive audience and the least amount of competition out there for you so why not try the worst thing that's going to happen is you're not going to get what you were hoping and then we can pull it off the market and try again once sip is lifted so that's for the sellers of vacant properties sellers of occupied properties it comes down to more comfort level conversation such as what Deidre was talking about and actually up until this week it hasn't even really been allowed so that it, it was more of a logistical conversation. For buyers, um, the conversation surrounds uh, fortune telling and, and future telling. <laughs> and so we, we always tell our buyers, you know, there's no way to predict the future and exactly where this is going. It changes day by day. But what I can tell you is that um, interest rates are at a historical low and they will eventually be going up. If you find a home that's right for you and your family right now in this time and place with um, a, you know, a price point and an interest rate that fits your budget and you're planning on staying in the home for the next five to seven years, there's no reason to wait. So th those are the two conversations that we're, we're having with buyers and sellers. Um, and of course, it all boils down to we're not going to fight them at all if they're not feeling comfortable. We are supporting and, um, you know, holding them where, where they are. Right. Danny, what, what kind of conversations are you having? So exactly what Deidre and Carrie are saying. It's, it's exactly that. It's about client comfort and the client knowing that you're there you know, working in their best interest as a fiduciary, trying to protect them. Occupied homes, really tough. I mean, up until maybe next week, we couldn't even go inside. So somebody wanted to sell a house that was occupied. I said, we can put it on. You can't show it. We'd have to take contingent deals until the SIP's lifted. If it's vacant, we're on the market. We're doing the virtual tours. Um, we're communicating with sellers about what activity is like. Uh, you know, echoing again what Carrie said earlier, inventory is really low. And as you, and um, Tina, you've been on this call with me where I talk about morale all the time, right? And I think it's really hard for agents to maintain morale when they're, you know, bullets are flying overhead and nobody knows what's going, the rules are changing every day. So although your question's about scripts, what I try to tell the agents is the spring market didn't happen. So that pent up demand is still there. It's going to come in the third and fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. Two, nobody built a thousand or a hundred thousand houses during the SIP. So there isn't some slug of inventory that's coming on the market. And the carriage point, which I love, which is interest rates are low. And that's just going to motivate people to come out. And I think the densification that we've seen in the cities is going to change. And people are going to come to the East Bay. They're going to come to our markets. Because they don't want to be so much stacked up on top of each other. So that's what I tell my agents. And I say, Hold on to those things, the three things that you can easily remember, spring market, no new inventory, low rates, and then take this time, work on your CRM, work on your, on your contact list, reach out to your clients. I don't use scripts, which was the start of your question, because I, I really believe you have to have your mouth closed and your ears open to listen to what your client wants. When I go on a listing appointment, I don't bring any paper. I just want to hear what, what, what are you looking for? What do you, what do you, what is, what is your concerns? And let me see if I can address those. I'll come back with comps later. So that's sort of how I've done it. Cause I, I think that 
a lot of times agents feel they have to be the star of the show or they're responsible for the market. And we're nothing but the navigators, psychotherapists and handholders. And we have to remember that, you know, and so that's how we function. That's how I function here. Um, I don't have any kind of script work in our firm. I don't have a bunch of Winkler clones running around. Everybody has their own style and they all develop how they want to develop. So I don't know if that helps everybody, but that's sort of what I think. I wanted to say something to Phil Weingrew because he said, will you address tenant occupied homes? Um, so Phil, we won't show a tenant occupied unit. The tenant won't let us in. We won't go anywhere near that. Uh, we actually blew up a deal over it this week. We're back on the market on 11th street with Ramona Riza. Uh, the buyer wasn't going to close without going inside. The tenants weren't going to let him in with the SIP. So we said, here's your deposit back. We tried. Um, just not willing to take the chance or the responsibility with that chance. Not taking any risk. Smart. Smart. Kenny, what kind of conversations are you having with buyers and sellers who have some intrepidation about getting into the market? Um, so for me, I, I don't use scripts. I kind of make them up every week and I t t tend to like have a certain script where if I come out from conference or I go learn something pretty cool. Um, I'll, I'll show you some of the things I, I'm talking about pretty frequently. So I can do a screen share. Um, I, I like to talk about like the, the Zillow traffic in the San Francisco uh, Bay Area. Traffic has been down average of 30% since shelter in place has been lifted. Um, let me zoom in real quick. Uh, but now it's, a, it's actually spiked higher and the demand has went up five to 15% higher than last year. And then this is my favorite trend. I love talking to clients about now because uh, I, I landed a big uh, listing in station house last night. Uh, the demand is out there, it's pent up. Shelter in place, we weren't able to show homes. Um, just yesterday, we listed a house on East 33rd Street and we already had six showing requests. This is an occupied home. Um, so it's kind of shocking to see how much traction we're getting on that one. And then if you look over here, this if you guys do Google Trends, you can look up certain keyword terms. Um, this is really interesting because that the market usually in the last two years, I, uh, this is pretty average. You're getting about I don't know, 59 million view, uh, searches on average every month for the term buy a home or buy a house. The house is in red because I think people are living in condos right now in smaller places. Uh, now they want to get the heck out of there so because they need that second office or a bit in their bedroom. But it's interesting since like shelter in place down here, uh, it's been spiking up a lot. And then we're seeing these crazy trends right now because I really thought maybe we were going to have a very lax version or relaxed version of shelter in place, but people are really, really uh, out looking at homes and want to look at homes. So I'm kind of leaving with that conversations. And then for a vacant property, so out of the 11 properties we have on the market, a nine of them are vacant. So we're, we're just going ahead and putting on the market. Uh, and then I'm, I'm, I'm talking to my clients about what I've learned every week. Early on in shelter in place, I've actually told my clients, I have no idea what's going on. You're going to have to give me some time to talk to other agents in my marketplace before I can give you any type of like good feedback. And then from what I've been hearing from the Alameda County agents and from the Contra Costa uh, agents, and did like masterminds. Oh yeah, last night I was in. I spoke on the San Jose Investors Mastermind panel. Brett Jennings, me, Brett Jennings, and a, and a big investor down there all thinks the prices are going to drop off five percent this year. So I'm leading with that for the, for the, all of our listings. Like uh, I, saw, I heard Tim Smith speak in uh, Cobalt Banker in Newport Beach. I think he does like three hundred million dollars a year, and he said sellers tend to in these cycles do better at the, if you're getting out early than getting out later because the market is going to decline. And it just makes more sense to get out now. So we're, we're giving that information and letting sellers make their best decision on whether they want to come to market or not. So again, this, this house that we just had this week uh, is the first occupied property I'm listing. And in Alameda next week, right across from Target, the newer development, we're, we're taking photos on Tuesday and we'll be launching that listing right away. So I think sellers are now more open and they're seeing the activity in the market due to Corona. It's calmed down, it's overall calmed down or it's turned into a manageable situation. Uh, and for a buyer side, I haven't really talked to too many buyers in the last month, uh, but it seems like the buyer activities have gone up quite a bit. And it's, it's, it was pretty, pretty dead in the last month. So my team of 12 very active buyers agent, we only wrote three offers in the last month, like 30 days. Prior to three days ago, we wrote three offers this week. So the activity there, if, if this team of really active agents are out there showing homes and nothing's coming in, uh, we're getting like, you know, a couple showings on like a 500 grand, two of my 500 grand condos are getting about three, three, four showings a week and no offers yet. Uh, but now more than ever, so there's no script, but we're, we're constantly, constantly updating the sellers every day because we have group text going on. They're asking us, hey, what's going on? Hey, what, what's going on? I wish I had better news to tell them, but we're telling them this is what's going on, going on with my other listings. Overall, everything is pretty slow. So you're not necessarily any, doing better, any better or worse. 
Uh, and then for pricing, I had a I had a West Oakland loft, a three bedroom on Eddie Street. I thought it would go fast. It's super cute, like um, in the two story Victorian thing. We had we only had what one, one set of three buyers showing that Saturday, and it's been silent since. And I thought that was going to be my hottest listing of like in the last two weeks. So being able to like bring the information from other agents and really being transparent about that has been really helpful in guiding my clients. Great, great. Um, so to stay on that with you, Kenny, and then I'll work my way back. What are some of the vehicles you're using to promote your listings, i.e. virtual open homes, Facebook Live, Zoom, WhatsApp? What, how are you promoting your virtual listings? Um, I think virtual, I mean, Carrie's has done it the best I've, I've heard of. The other person I've seen doing really well was Renee White, where she sent an Instagram and a mail and had, hey, come to my Facebook page for that. We haven't had any like, like unique thing we've done. We've created landing pages for it, but I think it's still kind of clunky. We do put in all of our just listed emails and no, uh, no showings are available. Virtual, uh, virtual showings are only, and then we're, we're doing the same thing as everybody else where, well, maybe not everyone else, but we have the recode data B camera which is pretty cool. So we're going out there, like personally do the 3D tours and everything. But the amount of virtual showings we have hasn't been that many. Uh, and then like, I, I wanna make sure people are distinguishing between virtual open house, a virtual showing, which an agent is usually doing, and then maybe a guided seller tour. We've done a couple guided seller tours uh, where we'll set up a time and the seller walks their property with their phone. And then the last one we did, we actually went ahead and recorded it with, with um, approval from everyone. And now, if people kind of like how you guys are going through extra step of the peep form and making sure you read the disclosures, we're, we're asking potential buyers to please look at the guy that seller tour video first before you uh, are even considering coming to our seller occupied property. Cause we really want to minimize the people uh, in the, in the homes. Daniel, what kind of, what kind of vehicles are you using for your virtual tours? It's all the same. I mean, it's you know Facebook Live, Instagram Live, email blasts. Uh, it's it's all of that so online marketing. Uh, we're doing a little bit of print. We, we're doing our first full page ad in a long time this Sunday in the Chronicle because um, I think we have eight or ten right now. So there isn't any secret there. It's the same thing. The hard part is how do you find the buyers? And what Carrie was talking about, I noticed in her comments when she had changed it to spelling out DOT and then calm to get through the filters and all that. I think getting the MLS to let us broadcast these tours on Sunday, like we post tour and open houses before, is really a key to getting the word out to buyers so that it shows up on Redfin, it shows up on Zillow, because that's how they're finding us now. So that's what we're doing. Um, we're, you know, that, that, that's the extent of it. We were trying to get the word out through social media. I think this experience has, turn all of our attention more heavily to social media. Kenny's a master at this. I really admire everything I see that he does and I've watched it for years. Um, and he, this SIP has forced us to sort of pay more attention to that. We hadn't candidly in the past, you know, we traditional marketing like Deidre, sort of old fashioned. Um, and, and, you know, that's always worked for us. And Deidre, I'm gonna answer your other questions, but it's too much for me to type right now with my fingers in the camera. So I'll, I'll get your questions answered. Thanks, Danny. Carrie, because you just recently did an open house, I thought it was fun. You created a cocktail party, and then you had people deliver cocktails to people's front porches or something. I don't remember. You explain it. I'll give it no justice. We did. So there was a particular property that we wanted to share the um, the sunset with everyone because it had a has a terrific view of the bay um, off of the deck and the dining room and also the living room. So we wanted to showcase the house at that magical golden hour. Um, so in order to do that, we marketed that um, if anyone could produce, so this was through uh, paid ads on Facebook and Instagram, if anyone could produce a pre-approval letter for um, 1.35, which was the list price, or higher, we would deliver a cocktail that was um, made specifically for the home uh, by a local mixologist. Um, and so we promote it through her page as well. 
we would deliver to the potential buyer's doorstep and their agent's doorstep this cocktail. And so we, we only ended up delivering 20 cocktails. I don't know if that's a good thing or bad thing. Um, <laughs> good thing on the pocketbook. Uh, we, we didn't know what to expect out of that. Is that something we'll do again? It was fun. I can tell you that I, the agent that Bernadette that we had from our team did the open house and um, she was sipping on her cocktail um, that she found in the refrigerator of the home while she was showing the home. So, um, you know, we're trying to make it fun. Uh, so we spent some money on cocktails. We spend money on, on the ads. Um, and then I already gave the details from before. I think the only other tip that I may have left, left out is um, as far as uh, how to go about logistically doing the, the virtual opens. Um, there's a thing called a gimbal. Some people might know what that is. Other people just type that G-I-M-B-A-L into Amazon, and it's a stabilizer for your phone, so it doesn't make everyone feel like Blair Witch Project motion sickness. Um, so the gimbal helps, or if you have someone else that you live with, um, so not, not a third party, but someone else that you live with that can follow you with your phone from a distance, that allows you to actually open a dishwasher and show the distance, uh, the walking space between that and the island, or um, it allows you to also, uh, you know, just get full body views, which is a lot better than the, you know, the selfie style videoing. Um, and that way they can see your face, they can see you talking about the home at the same time that you're showcasing the home. So those are some extra tips that we've figured out along the way. Love it. Deidre. Yeah. So what vehicles are you using, Facebook Live, whatever, to do your virtual tours or showcase your homes? So I have gotten the 3D Matterport. Um, as I mentioned before, I have walked through and had um, somebody video me walking through the house. Um, I always have had um, worked with a graphic artist, though, to um, do Instagram um, postings of my listings with information, and I boost those, those posts. And then um, I'm showing my age. Like yesterday, I noticed that Carrie's listing um, on Jordan uh, was pending, so I called and asked um, who was the person who didn't get it? And then, you know, I reached out to that person because I have something with, I, I mean, I'm making phone calls. I know that that's not the tech savvy thing to do, but like if I notice that an agent has sold a lot in a particular area or typically has a book of buyers, I'll call them. I mean, it was really funny before SIP, I had a listing on, on Alcatraz and I knew it had challenges because it was on a busy street next door to an apartment building. And, you know, when I go on broker's tour, I'm like, hey, you know, to an agent, you know, I noticed that you showed this house. I said, I hope you bring an offer. You know, I, I kind of speak up and, and, and talk because I think that's effective. And I think that especially Right now, when people don't really know what's happening with the market, picking up the phone, whether you have a buyer or a seller, to find out what the expectation is so that you can then maybe call your client and go, hey, this is actually a transparent price, or hey, they really said they won't sell unless they get blah, 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 or oh, this agent called me and somehow this listing was under the radar and they're just looking for a good offer and I didn't even notice it. So I think that we can't just rely on social media because we might get views from people and our friends and our family, but us agents are the people that are making the transactions happen. And sometimes I'll even call a lender and I go, hey, who do you have pre-approved in this price range? Um, you know, 
maybe you can mention it to their agent. I think that just being a squeaky will is something that you're going to have to do in this industry no matter what, right? Like even before SAP, you get a lead, you follow up, nothing. You get a lead, then you email, nothing. And then sometimes you have to like email three times. Sometimes people will be like, you know what? I met somebody at an open house I'm already taken care of or oh, I've been meaning to respond to you. Work's just been really crazy, but I still would like to meet with you. And you have to just be able to um, be okay with rejection, be okay with um, all sorts of things that are kind of thrown your way because it's just business and you can't take it personally and you have to just be that squeaky wheel. But I would say pick up the phone, um, especially right now, you know, there, I'm seeing that, listings that might have gotten six to eight they're now getting maybe one to three offers but that still are those, those still are people who have um v, you know viewed houses you can find out who's even viewed houses who's pulled disclosures with disclosure io we have so much more information and you can just take that and if you have relationships and rapport with your colleagues you can really get the word out in a, in a meaningful way to people who actually are looking to buy and looking to sell. Yeah, yeah. So here's a question in uh, the way I frame it is, in this day and age, let's all just give away our secret sauce. Uh, you know, nothing's proprietary. Let's just share with each other and support each other. So. What vendors are you using that, that you like? What photographers, virtual staging? What, who are you utilizing and who's willing to do stuff <laughs> within the orders, within the COVID orders from the county? Uh, so Kenny, who are you using? Going in at the run uh, to another thing in five minutes. Um, our, our photographer is Christian Klugman. We just love his work. That's pretty much all we use. And then we use a really great website called usepillar.com to create amazing single property websites within seven minutes. Uh, and virtual staging, I know like lots of different vendors offer it. We found this new site, up, I didn't remember it, but they charge $8 for virtual staging only per photo, which is extremely cheap. If you guys look at my new listing at 801 Franklin Street, uh, you can see examples of that. It isn't as like high, super high end, whatever, but it, it, for eight bucks, you can't really beat that. And then. Our, our go-to is Box, uh, Box Brownie because Box Brownie is one of the few virtual photo companies that offers uh, image removal. Because there's lots of other companies out there, but then they don't take things away. So unless you have a vacant home, they can't really work with that. Uh, and then Box Brownie also now, crazy, they do these uh, 3D tours sit together, which I think the price is unbeatable. Uh, it's like, if you send them 3D, 15 3D pictures, they'll stitch up for you and make the floor plan $15. I'm guessing they have someone overseas. For you to do that will probably take you an hour and a half. I would, I would pay the 15 bucks. Uh, so those are my main three vendors. Really recommend you can get maybe someone on your team or, or co-agent or someone in your office buy a Rico Theta B camera. It's $369, a great investment. The cool part of this camera is kind of weird. Anyone, anywhere with that camera can go to any listing and upload a 3D tour to your property. So most of our listings, like a 1,200 square feet uh, property, it takes like 15 minutes to, uh, to put together. Oh, so property, someone asked me, property website, use pillar, U-S-E-P-I-L-L-A-R. Um, we, we've been using that on pretty much all of our listings right now. Cool, and I have to run that the, uh, another thing. Thank you, guys. Hey, what happened? Hey, good luck. Hi, Kenny. Another commitment, but I was just grateful he would give us the first hour. So thank you, Kenny, and we'll carry on with Daniel, Carrie, and Deidre. So yeah, who are you using, Danny? Who are your vendors? Just share some names. So, so um, we really love open homes photography. Uh, I love the whole package and suite of options that they um, offer. Um, I like how the website flows. I like how it loads. I like how it's good on phone, iPad, or on the computer. We, for, for inspections, we like East Bay Structural, we like uh, GT Inspects, we like Mayor. Uh, so for Pest, those are really good guys. I like Brian Cogley when I can get him. Uh, Paul Barraza from John McComas. These are the people I like to use for inspections and, and stuff like that. I, I like the results of the work and I like the reputation in the industry. I think it's important to have the reports and the disclosure packages. I'd like to dub for just a second on what Deidre said a moment ago. Oh, I, 
Some agents from other companies will call me up sometimes to ask my opinion. One of these other agents called me up and they had 14 packages out and no offers. And I said, have you called them? And he goes, well, no. And I go, well, why not? Should I? Yeah. Get a spreadsheet out, put the name of every agent that pulled the disclosures on the left side, call them up and write down every bit of feedback you get as to why they didn't write. Then call your seller and say, here are the 14 reasons so that you have that data. But you've got, real estate's a contact sport. You can't do it without reaching in and asking. So I, I totally, when Deidre was saying that, I'm like, thumbs up. That's it. Yeah. So good. Thanks, Danny. Carrie, who, who are the vendors you're using? Uh, so, sorry, I thought Deidre was going to go before me. I don't know why. Um, you ready? <laughs> no, no, I am, I am. We use uh, Open Homes Photography, as mentioned by Daniel. Um, for staging, when we're physically able to stage, we're using Camille Long, who is a local single mom who we love supporting her and her, her life. Um, and then we also do use Box Brownie to clean up photos um, and, you know, create the the exploding uh, twilight effect <laughs> uh, for pretty cheap, cheaper than a photographer would uh, charge you for that. And, um, and then as far as the 3D floor plans, we did recently purchase a Insta360 camera, which won't break the bank. And just like what Kenny said, it, it takes about 15 minutes to do the whole property. Um, and uh, I'm gonna see about getting them stitched together by Box Brownie, because that's a lot cheaper than Matterport. So. Nice. Wow. nice. So Deidre, who, who are your vendors? Who are you using? Um, I have um, a, a guy that I requested open home photography and but most of the people there are really good. Um, I, I do like the convenience of everything kind of on one shot, but I didn't, I was underwhelmed and I thought the pricing for virtual staging was too high. So um, I recently added a few pictures from um, Box Brownie on one of my listings. In a way though, I still layered them with the unstaged uh, pictures because that way when people come in, it, it's not like a, you know, oh, you know. Um, and um, in terms of um, Red Oak, we're fortunate enough to have a videographer who has made a few videos for me. So I'm really fortunate to have that. Um, in terms of vendors, um, Brian Cogley is somebody I worked with for many years for a home inspector. Paul Barraza is somebody who I also trust from JMC quite a bit. They will only right now inspect vacant properties. David Tier will inspect an occupied property if they leave. And I think that, um, you know, from the buyer's protection group, he's really, um, I, I like him. Um, I've been working with Dan Marzelli before I was even a realtor. He did work on my house, you know, 20 years ago. If I can't get Dan, I love Steve. Um, you know, I, if, I, if it's a house in Montclair or I feel that it's the need, on occasion I'll use East Bay Structure, John Lee, Burton Chin. Um, and then um, staging, I use Ken McHale a lot and I use uh, Visual Jill. You know, it depends on people's budgets. I mean, here's the thing right now. We have to be very careful because, you know, you're asking people, um, and I mean, I know it's a little bit different with SIP, but let's just face it, frankly, some of the listings that I'm working on, we've been working on before all of this happened. And so you've asked people to invest in their home, and it, it is investing in their home. They're not doing it for you, the agents. It does help us agents sell their house better. But right now, you know, what are we doing here when we don't know how the market's going to shake out? And right now, um, in terms of 
people counting on us to give them advice on where to go now and while we're prepping houses, we have to be conscious of the fact that they might not get as much as maybe they would have two months ago. And I think having that conversation with your clients, you know, next week if we're able to legally stage, I know Contra Costa County has said that it's legal to stage. Um, we have to have those conversations. We have to revisit comps again, and we have to revisit things as we're working with clients to bring things on the market because we can't just assume that people wanna sell at any price. And we can't just assume that the number that you told them five months ago, four months ago is still gonna be that number. And so, um, you know, right now there's people I know who are, you know, changing out lights and in the middle of bathroom projects that got on hold. And I think we need to have those conversations, especially also adding on top of that, staging's expensive. I mean, I love Studio D. They charged a client $12,000 last year, you know, and, you know, that's a lot of money and they do beautiful work, but we have to start talking about the, the budgets and the expectations. That's absolutely true. Stay on top of your finances. So while you do these virtual tours, how are you lead capturing? How are you finding out who's looking at them? Who's interested? What vehicles are you using to capture leads? Anybody have anything they want to share? Yeah. Any, Carrie, are you? When, when, when I'm doing a virtual tour, um, the, the, you know, first of all, it, you know, we talk about vendors, we should probably mention Katie Lance um, because she's really good at coaching and talking about some of this social media and virtual um, opens. So one of the tips she gave that really resonated with me is acknowledging everybody that comes on to your virtual tour. When you see them post something or wave or whatever, say their name, hi, Tina, hi, Carrie, hi, Deidre. And then I ask, if you have questions, reach out. Here's my phone number. You know, Carrie said it too. Here's how you can reach us. So you have to ask for it. I don't have a form um, where people sign in to be at the virtual tour. And I understand some agents that were doing this on Zoom, they got bombed on Zoom by trolls. So you got to be somewhat careful with it. I don't know how you capture the leads yet. It's going to be evolving. And the, truly the people that want to buy, they're going to reach out. I mean, it's sort of like what Deidre was saying, instead of having eight offers, you got one to three, but those one to three are serious people. And the people that are out right now are serious. That, that, that's what I think. So, um, you know, ask for, the, ask for the order. Say, if you want more information, you want to set up a private showing, please reach out. And, uh, or reach out to your agent if you don't want to poach. Yep, yep. Yep, Carrie, Deidre, how are you guys capturing leads? Or are you? Uh, well, I mean, just through Facebook ads, the Eventbrite um, for our seminar logins, uh, we have, as far as capturing leads on Facebook Good. while while the virtual tours are happening, is that what you're asking? Uh, uh, buyers that are seeing the virtuals and wanting more information, how are you capturing these leads? Well, I mean, all their comments are live perpetually. So we reach out to them, um, direct message them, ask them if they, you know, if this isn't the house for you, what, what would be the right house? What do you need an extra bedroom? Do you, you know, need a garage, large garage or things to start in, uh, you know, getting, generating a conversation. I'm not uh, generating any online leads from any of the um, social media tools that I have used, but I do feel that what I'm putting out will, you know, or are, are like planting seeds. And I think that the people that are watching, you know, might go, oh, you know, I like how she put that out or whatever the case is, or, oh, maybe this is somebody that, um, I can call on in the future. People notice. I and also how you present yourself and being accessible and being down to earth really helps. I remember years ago I hosted an open house. I talked to everybody. I wasn't salesy. I just was I tried to be approachable. I said to everybody who was there, um, you know, if you have questions or if you don't understand something or, you know, just let me know. Like 
ask me anything. And that there was a couple that came and um, they had an agent and they were frustrated with their agent and she couldn't remember my name. She couldn't remember anything about who I was, but she remembered that there was an, a, a, a logo on my flyer that had a tree on it that she didn't even keep, but she just remembered a tree and maybe on the sign. So she started Googling like real estate companies with trees. Then she found Red Oak. She went through every profile, found me, and I've sold her two houses since. So I just think that right now, you know, like you have to be in it for the long game. And I think that it's gonna not just be like a one-off. And also, um, one thing that I try to do if I have like a great relationship with a client, and I always wait until we're closed, I then friend them on social media. And then I start, you know, commenting on their kids growing or things like that. I know this is super old fashioned and I'm dating myself again, but I do feel that engaging with your clients and your sphere and them then seeing some of your listings and how you put things off is really helpful because they only saw you as a buyer's agent, right? They don't know that you sell things. They don't see that. And it's just kind of taking that client from like a strictly professional relationship and then bringing them into both your personal and professional mix. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'd like to take this last half hour, if we even need it all, and open it for questions, or even if you guys have some best practices you've been doing to help feed the whole body, our whole community, so uh, just unmute yourself if you have any questions or feedback. Well, how are you guys all doing just morale wise? I mean, yeah. I think that that's something that a lot of people aren't talking about and I like to talk about because, you know, it's, 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 it's stressful in a lot of ways to, not know the answers and a lot of us want to be the expert and they we want to be able to have answers for people um and we might not have them so how are people's morale how are we doing i can answer that yes rosa <laughs> um you know i think having keeping a your morale up is a part of allowing yourself to be down and, and experience the emotions that you are having when they're not considered positive. But um, that's, that's one way, but also attending webinars like this, like I have to be honest, I've had a really crappy week and I came here uh, in hopes of keep getting my, my morale bo boost, which I have, thank you very much. And um, listening to the one thing, you know, doing things, to help that are that are in this uh, uh, putting that are meant to put you in the positive mind frame, but mainly really just allowing yourself to have those down time that that moment where you just feel like falling apart. I highly encourage you you to fall apart. Then, when you've exhausted it, pick yourself up and try to catch a webinar or something, a a, a podcast or something. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, this is uh, Joey Wong. Uh, I've got a question for uh, any of you guys. Um, I'm just curious as far as the deals that you guys have closed, um, as far as financing, if you've noticed any particular segment of the financing market has impacted your, you know, your buyer's ability to close. I'll say that... Um the the larger banks right now are uh pretty disappointing <laughs> they're not they they don't care if there's a timeline involved at the moment um so i'm not going to name exact names but i have been underwhelmed by by the larger banks that i've been a party to either on the the listing side or the buyer side right now so um, we, I try to stay away from the money center banks for the, exactly that reason. Um, I adore JVM Lending. They've been terrific. 
I like Bill Zerner and Alex Alexander from Summit. They've been terrific. We have not had loan issues on deals. However, we are alerted that non-QM mortgages for higher end things, you have to be very careful on. Yep. Our marketplace, a lot of the people that are buying these more expensive homes have capital reserves. They're not coming in there with five or 10% down on a jumbo trying to sneak in. They have three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars, and they're able to satisfy what the bank's doing. And I think you'll see more eighty, ten, ten. Danny, you froze. So Danny froze. Um, I'll tell you, is he's right. Just pay attention. Talk to your lender. Stay on top of it. Uh, Non-conforming loans are going to be tighter. And yet people are still closing. There you are, you're back. You froze on us. Nope, no problem. So that that's 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 something that I would tell you to, to sort of be aware of. Relationship matter. Um, I'm appraisers are willing to do drive by after the interior. So some of that is is a good thing. Um, I do feel that higher end homes like two million plus, those are gonna get really sluggish. And you might see a five or ten percent reduction there because that's Spending than say homes under a million five, which is sort of our breadbasket, you know, what people need for housing. You know, it's a million dollars to a million five. So, I comment on financing, Joey. I think um, five or more units on apartment buildings, that's a whole different bailiwick. Uh, you know, Casey Wright from Rincon Financial has been able to help me. I was looking at some stuff in Reno, and he says he can get financing. So, I feel pretty good again about who you know. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nice. Anybody else? What's your experience, Deidre? Um, you know, I'm just, I haven't had any issues. That's great. Um, you know, right now when I, I have gone into contract, I think on five things since SIP and, you know, you have to pick up the phone and vet everything with the lender before you would recommend that your buyer accept an offer. And, you know, the questions that I, I ask are, you know, ha have you recently pulled the credit and verified income and assets and are any of the down payment funds, um, you know, tied to the stock market? And, you know, I think that luckily, knock on wood, uh, there hasn't been any issues. And I think that you just have to do your due diligence. And I think you have to take a leap of faith. I think so many times you know, we got so used to um, non-contingent offers. And I don't think that that's going to be what we're going to be seeing going forward. And a lot of the deals that um, I've seen in the last uh, few weeks have had a contingency in, in some regard. And, you know, it's funny because I had a seller who said to me, well, I only want, this is before SIP and everything else. She said, I only wanted to accept non-contingent offers. And I said, okay. Well, those days I think might have changed. And, you know, back if you rewind to what, eight years ago, nine years ago, how many offers had contingencies? A lot of them. And those deals closed too. And if you're getting your pre inspections done, if you're looking at the comps when you're pricing things, if you're setting your sellers up for a realistic expectation of value, then the houses, should appraise at prices your clients are okay with. There should not be no any big surprises when it comes to the in, an inspection contingency. And you know, if you're at least vetting um, the pre-approval, um, that's a good thing. If you do have, and and I just you know, in the past, and Danny and Tina, you can tell me if this is something that would still fly. Years ago, in the past when a pre-approval came on a listing, you know, from someone I've never heard of and, you know, or, you know, felt questionable about the pre-approval, I have countered people just to get backup pre-approval um, by somebody that I, I have uh, worked with in the past um, for backup purposes only. I know you can't dictate who somebody uses, um, but in the past I, I have done that. Um, but I haven't had any, any issue. And I think the biggest thing is, is if a buyer wants to buy and a seller wants to sell, it will work. I agree. Um, you know, you talk about 
the backup offer thing. I mean, the uh, backup lender thing, that sort of thing. So sometimes you get like a pre-approval from Alexandria, Virginia with somebody you've never heard of before, right? When I've been the actual agent in the deal, and this is a concern about the approval, when I've gone to the buyer's agent, I said, look, we'd love for them to be in backup. If they don't use it, I'll pay for the appraisal. So that the buyer has no economic risk, but if their lender doesn't perform, the buyer has to pay for that second appraisal. So that's how I've tried to massage that when I'm in negotiations. Yeah. And there's been a couple of times where I have said to somebody, love your offer. I'm, I'm concerned about your lender. And, you know, you would never put this in writing, obviously. And I would just say, and here's the reasons why I'm concerned. And there's been a couple of times that the buyer's agent on their own, you know, tenacity wanting to make the deal work has... Um, has uh, gotten them another approval from somebody local. And they said, oh, thank, thank you for calling me with this because I have been trying to get them with a local lender. And me calling them and saying, hey, the listing agent loves your offer, but she's apprehensive about your lender was the catalyst to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Hey, I have a wild question for everyone. <laughs> Who? Who thinks open houses are ever going to come back? I mean, like, before they find some sort of cure or um, vaccine for, for the virus, how long do you think that's going to be? Is it going to literally be like a whole nother season of zero open houses? Or I know none of us can tell, but even comfort wise, would anyone even have an open house right now if they were allowed to? I don't know. I don't feel comfortable right now. You know, I'm already, you know, a little nervous going to the grocery store with all of the protocol you have to do right now. I had a listing um, that was packed. I mean, you know, it was packed. And I thought, you know, to myself, and this is why we actually canceled an open house um, the Sunday before SIP was because I knew that there couldn't be social distancing mm -hmm. and, you know, people bring their kids and people touch everything. And if thing, if this really is living on surfaces far, you know, I went to drop my car at the service station the other day and there were people without masks or gloves, even though they're saying that you're supposed to do it. So how do you enforce it? And are you going to be like that asshole? Oops, excuse me. Um, is this is recorded? Are you going to be that person that's like no mask, no entry? You know, I could just. I don't want to be that person. Well, I certainly hope open houses come back because I love having open houses. I just think it's a great opportunity to meet people and to to talk and to share stories, and you learn so much about what what's going on and everything that's happening. I think for people, they really need to get touch and feel the house. Yeah. I see where you have a rule about how many people are in the house at one time and you have somebody helping you with that and I could see where you have masks on and nobody touches things and that sort of stuff as we get back into into business um, I have stopped people so on my virtual open house on Sunday I had a couple want to walk in with some and I said guys you can't do that I, I mean I hate to say this to you but if you cross the threshold you're breaking the law so here's my card send me an email, I'll send you the PED, and I'll meet you here at another time to show you the house. So I, I see it coming slowly, just like restaurants will come back slowly, and it breaks my heart what's going on with restaurants and bars. I mean, I'm so sad for that whole industry. It's, it's really tough, so. Yeah, I think it's gonna come back phased, just like yeah. offices will be phased. And I'm happy to be the asshole. Today at my office, we were in there, cleaning it, getting it ready for the phasing of allowing, you know, one agent or 10 agents at a time and someone showed up and wanted to go in and we weren't ready. Um, I was that way because I cared about them. Exactly. It's exactly what it is. It's okay, I call for love any day of the year. Because if I care about you, I'm not going to let you risk your life or anyone else's doing this. So yeah, that's how we have to think about it. It's not that you're the bad guy, you're actually the good guy. They may not like you in the moment, just like our kids don't like us when we think 
play with knives and we're the bad guy for them, but we're really the good guy. And you just have to know that. And you're going to do that with your open houses. You're going to do that with your buyers who insist they need to go in, even though we don't even know if they can get a loan. You're going to have to do that with a lot of people. That's kindness. That's true kindness. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hate to do this, but I have to go. I have a meeting in West Oakland, so I've got to jump. It's been great being with such a distinguished yeah. panel to talk shop. And I admire all of you. I love watching what you're doing it's fantastic. May you all be healthy and have a great weekend. Talk to you all later. Bye. Bye, Daniel. All right. Anybody else have anything to say? And I love, Deidre, that you brought up morale. Right now, you know, in our office, we say it's one for all, all for one. We've got to lift each other up. It is where you're the happiest is when you're contributing to your community. You can't do that unless you take the oxygen mask first. Unless you're filling up your bucket, you got nothing to give anyone else. So what are you doing? Are you getting enough sleep? Or is your subconscious mind kicking in at three in the morning saying, ah, you're right? So what are you doing? Ask yourself, are you routinizing your day, your sleep, you being real careful with your food, getting exercise? you know, whatever it, whatever practice, religious, spiritual practice, I don't care, but are you doing it? Are you taking care of yourself? But the most important thing is gratitude, noticing what's going right, and giving back to others. That is going to fill your bucket faster than anything else. So anybody, any feedback questions we haven't addressed? We've got just got a few minutes left, and then I'm going to have Carrie and Deidre, since they're the last two standing, do some final statements about running a virtual business and, and what they what would, what would they really want to say to you during this time. Anybody have any questions, feedback, thoughts? All right, well, let's start with Deidre. You know, what would you say? Here's, we've got the range. We got brand new agents to some really established, iconic agents on this call. What would you have to say to them about running a virtual business, about showing up during this time, or anything else that comes to your mind? Well, I mean, I've done a couple and I need to do more. I mean, this is a good reminder of um, video of, um, you know, what's going on or even just me, you know, I felt like so homebound at first in my yard. And I think it's totally fine to let people see you in your sweats um in your true self um i think that people appreciate that it makes you more approachable um i i don't think that there has to be perfection um out there when it comes to the video aspect um in terms of the photography and everything else you're doing i think now more than ever um that's something that you don't want to skimp on if you have a listing or if you're marketing something that you want it to to show its best because you you know people are gonna you are what you put out there in terms of how you market a a property i will say um the first two weeks for sure i felt way out of sorts i own it like I was not in a good space. Even today, I really wasn't in a good space. And I don't think that you have to, right? Because you have a lot as agents on your shoulders. You know, you are facilitating such a big transaction for people and they're counting on you. And it's really easy to feel the pressure and let that get to you. I tend to be a perfectionist and, you know, it's, it just acknowledge that you're not always that good. You know, I think that some of these things with social media are that you're only putting out like this facade of like everything's great. And I think that it's okay to just be real sometimes um, or, you know, not answer a call when you're in a bad mood and wait until you're in a good headspace. Um, some of the things that I plan to work on this month um, are um, better systems, um, organizing my files, um, working on um, a brochure that's been on my plate for a very long time that I haven't done. Um, I think that we um, hopefully can use this time to make ourselves better for when we can relaunch. 
That's great advice, Deidre. Carrie, what do you have? What are your final words? What would you want to say to people on this call? You're, you're muted. You're muted. Good. Okay, so the first thing I want to say is if anyone else wants us to do the cocktail hour again, um, let me know. But the address is on Marin in Berkeley. This is shameless plug. It's uh, 2582 Marin. So if you have any clients that are looking for a 4-2 in, uh, in North Berkeley with gorgeous views and a heart-shaped hot tub, uh, let me know. We'll, we'll redo the cocktail hour. Um, Secondly, concentrate on the things that you can control. There's so many things out of control right now. And just concentrate on the things that you can control. Just like Deidre said, you know, if nothing else, get your systems together. Um, go through your CRM and, uh, and clean that all up. Um, what I'm doing is I'm keeping a, a list in the front of my notebook of all the awesome things that I'm going to hold on to and like embrace that coming out of the COVID-19 uh, shutdown period. Um, some of those are the seller seminars via Zoom. I, sure, it was on my very long someday I'll get to to-do list and now I've done it and it's written and it's, we're doing it. We're working out the bugs now. Um, so seller seminar, buyer seminar, investor seminar, virtual open houses are not going away. They're going to be a thing for a while. And I feel like they're a lot more effective at actually selling the house. Regular open houses are for lead generation. Virtual open houses are to sell the house. Um, 3D Matterport or 3D tours. I bought the Insta360 camera. That was one of those things where we complicate things to justify our inactions. I was like, how am I going to learn how to ever use a, and then shutdown happened and I'm like, let's get on the Amazon, order one of these things, now's the time. And it's so easy. So that video tours, which actually like give people that feeling, those are going to stay. Um, the new TAN network that's coming out of this. I mean, at least we're having the time to actually play with it. And that is addressing the whole non-compete situation. Um, I, that's on my list of cool things that are coming out of the shelter in place that I'm embracing and going to hold on to and keep in my toolbox. Um, and then I know that that caused our office to um, fast track a concierge program for our agents, which I'm super excited about. Um, but, you know, this is not supposed to be a brokerage plug, so I'm just going to leave that there, right there. But that's on my list. So, um, but anyways, I think just having that list of, like, the cool things, because, you know, it's been, I don't even know how long it's been. It's been, like, a month and a half, two months. And I feel like, oh my God, we haven't done anything and like we're at half the production that we have, we plan to do in our, you know, with our goals and all of that. And then I go back and look at what we have accomplished and that just like makes all the doom and gloom go away. Like, oh my God, we're so much better for it. And so I think that's the, the part that I want to leave is just keep those lists for yourself so you can go back to them and be like, oh yeah. I did some stuff, you know, during that time. And then, of course, um, use the non-commute time to hug on your littles and your loved ones and your furry ones and give them the attention that they deserve. Thank you, Carrie. All right. So everyone, let everyone know, every Friday at 1 o'clock, Bridge MLS is going to be sponsoring us doing this uh, virtual Zoom top agent mastermind. Next week, I have Leah Tonger, Andrea Gordon. Oh my goodness, the third pace person went out of my head. Three amazing icons in our industry will be on the panel. Be here next week, every Friday, one o'clock. And I'm going to promise you, these people will be bringing you really high level stuff and the whole point of it is stuff that you can put into action right now. Doesn't do any good to talk about it. 
walk away with at least one thing you can implement from this because it could really make a difference in your mindset and in your business. And I want to thank you all for showing up. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Deidre, Carrie, and of course, Danny and Kenny, who I had to leave. Thank you all for doing that, coming from Contribution. Thank, thank you, you for running it. <laughs>